You're listening to The Other 50%, a history of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I spoke with BAFTA and RTS-nominated Chloe Thomas, who is in the UK and most recently directed all episodes of the psychological thriller The Deceived, created by Lisa McGee of Dairy Girls fame and Tobias Beer. Just before that, Chloe directed episodes of Harlots and Victoria, and she is attached to direct the feature film Making Babies, a rom fertility com by Deborah Francis White with Red Wave Films. Previously, Chloe was known for comedy directing, Jared Horgan's early sitcom Angelos, followed by being BAFTA nominated for directing the first ever series of Horrible Histories. Chloe also develops her own pilots through her company, One Glove Films. We had a good chat about directing both as a woman and an introvert and exploring new models of power. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. Okay, here's my conversation with Chloe Thomas. Keep in mind, this was recorded the last week of September, so we recorded remotely, and any references to recent times may be outdated. And if we refer to the upcoming election, obviously it hadn't happened yet, so that is the context. Okay, here, have a listen. Are you back at work? No, but, you know, for a freelance director, it's like back at work is quite an odd concept, really, because you're... Now I'm really fortunate. This has only happened in the last two to three years that I'm actually being sent scripts that are all really interesting in their own way. It, oh, you know, it looks like you said I'm successful and, you know, I'm really enjoying it at the moment, but it's taken a long time. Not that I haven't been doing interesting things before, but actually to get to what I really want to do, which is drama directing. Okay, now we're, we've kind of jumped into the middle of the podcast. Let's back up a minute because I like for you to tell us uh, what is it that you do. I'm a fiction director, and that includes drama and comedy, and mostly television. But you're moving into film now. I direct mostly television, but I am attached to a feature film, and I'm also developing my own ideas, which I would love to be feature films. Oh, wonderful. Okay, let's talk about your most current project, because I think it just finished airing. Yes, that's The Deceived. And it's a four-part thriller for a UK channel called Channel 5. And it's got two things that really people latch onto. One is it's written by the writer and creator of Dairy Girls, which has been a huge... I love Dairy Girls. Which has been a, a massive international hit and rightly so because it's really great and so that's Lisa McGee and this time she's writing with her husband Toby Beer Tobias Beer who um so it's the first thing they've written together and it's a thriller and obviously she's known for comedy but they also absolutely love things like Murder She Wrote and Hitchcock and so they wanted to write a sort of classic thriller so it's a classic thriller and the other thing that people pick up on is that it's got man of the moment new hot talent Paul Mescalin who has shot to fame in normal people and we oh, yeah. cast him straight after normal people because well, he was an unknown but we knew he'd been in it and we hadn't seen any of it but we knew it was going to be big and actually as soon as he did the audition we knew he was brilliant like whether oh, yeah. he'd been in that you just would cast him because he's really good so there's two things that everyone knows but it, it's a the deceived is a four-part thriller set in Cambridge, UK, and also in Donegal um, in Ireland. And it's filmed sort of mainly in Northern Ireland, actually. Okay, now Dairy Girls, I have to admit, I have to watch with the captions on because they talk so fast and every line is so funny and I don't want to miss one syllable of it. Am I going to have to have the captions on for this too? No, I don't think so. It's not, it's not, it's not the same. Donegal is a slightly different accent. It's a bit, um, it, it's, it's interesting because it's got, for my ears, my English ears, it's got a kind of northern twang of Southern Ireland, but it's what you might say softer than maybe Belfast. I mean, it is, you know, because, so it, I don't think you'll need it, no. I, I, I mean, it's so actually, delicious. Yeah, it, there is there is actually some Irish in it, Irish being spoken, which is nice to hear. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Now, tell me how you became a director in the first place. Did you always know that's what you wanted to do or did you work your way into it? How did that go? How I became a director in the first place was actually 
to begin with, I do. I didn't even know it existed. Like I wasn't one of those kids that grew up going, oh, "I want to be a director." Because if you just said, "I didn't even know that TV was made," if you know what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Conceptual difficult. Like but, you don't know that's a thing. Yeah, just so. But I did a lot of acting. I really liked acting, and I was in a lot of plays, and I got really into theatre, and that was the thing I most liked doing. And I was in lots of youth theatre, and I decided that I wanted to do a drama degree. And when I got there, that was at Bristol University, I was surrounded by people who were obsessed by acting and I realised I wasn't any good (laughs) and that everyone should do it and I shouldn't. But I didn't really know what to do. And there was a competition and it was to write a script and I wrote, it was a treatment, I wrote it and they said, what do you want to do on it? It was for a short film. And I said... I couldn't, I couldn't bear the idea of someone doing it. So I just said, I want to direct it. I had no idea what that meant. But I was helping out the postgraduate students on their film shoots. And then I just worked it out. So storyboarded it. And then once I'd done that, and that was as an undergraduate, I realized this was a, a perfect synthesis of writing, art, uh, acting, everything. And I and also thought it's something that's, it's really hard. Like it, it, it it's really hard. You have to keep practicing and also you make massive mistakes all the time. But it's so interesting and so much fun and so rewarding when you get it right, uh, even though you don't get it all right, that actually it's something you want to keep on doing. So in that, with that project, did you think this, this is my thing? I, I, again, I had no idea how to do it. I didn't think I could do it in my life. The idea of being paid for it be pretty amazing but it was definitely this is my thing this I really like and also I was really into animation but I I didn't have the patience to do it but I really love I still like animation because I like magic things so um yeah so I did think this is my thing and then I thought oh maybe I could film school so then every step do you also see what I mean? Every step then led to the next thing, with but very sort of windy. So then did you go to film school? I did go to film school. Um, I went to a school that then became really well known. I went to Bournemouth, which was at the time one of the best and now has got, still got a really good reputation. And um, so I did that for a year. And then I was really broke and I sort of I was unemployed. And my friends were sort of getting the odd short film and I just was getting nothing. And so I started temping in the BBC. So I was doing being a secretary and thinking, and I not only was I a secretary, I owed the film school a couple of thousand pounds and I had nowhere <laughs> paying it. So, um, but then after that sort of, but again, I, I applied to the, I was at the BBC and I applied to their training scheme, which was really hard to get into. And I got onto it and that was, that's a two year training scheme. But it's ma- interestingly, it's mainly to train you to go into factual TV and also to become a BBC person. And much as I love the BBC, after after two years, I thought, I don't want to stay here. I want to be creative. I want to be freelance and I want to make my own mistakes. So how did you make that leap? I just decided, right, I'm going to be freelance. And everyone went, but you've been with the BBC. Why are you not staying in the BBC? But I could see that career position progression goes eventually gets further away from directing because if you get promoted you become a producer and exec head of department whatever in those days that was in the 2000s and I just thought I don't want to do that I want to be directing my only my idea of promotion is to get to work on a better project it's not to get a new job title I, I just want the same job title that's quite boring isn't it but it, it's a different way of at that point you know your mum and dad they do panic about you yeah and they kind of go why don't you stay in the BBC and they think, well, she's all that's right a now. good solid job that yeah. you can have forever it's all right now she's in the BBC to stop worrying about her and then I went oh, I'm, new, I'm freelance I go well, have you got anything to go to no <laughs> trust me it'll be fine and then I spent a long time being unemployed trying to write a script and so and then I and then my first freelance job was a was a fashion show that I really didn't want to do and it was it, and I just thought oh my god you know and then it was really you know but eventually it all works out so it was a lot of factual work which and I got sort of sidetracked in a way because I was trying to get into drama and I was trying to get into comedy and so uh it was just hard i i could just tell i just wasn't getting through i just really wasn't so were you hired then as a director or did you have to make your own projects to kind of get proven how did you how did you get that first paying freelance gig uh the first one i was hired as a director actually um from an ex bbc person who knew me on the training scheme so it, do, it did obviously help me um and 
it was as a director, but it was it again. It what I'm saying is it was sort of it was factual entertainment. They call it here. So it was a very format show where people go shopping and they get made over. And I was being, I just, partly I just thought, why am I doing this? But again, you know, it, it, what the difference is, you are in the commercial world. You have to cut something on time and all those skills are useful. So, yeah, I did get hired direct, but And I got more and better gigs. I did a lot of arts documentaries and I'm good at them. Um, and I love art. I absolutely love art and architecture. But then I got very frustrated because I thought I want to make my own. I want to direct my own thing. But I don't want to make a film about other someone else's art, which sounds. Yeah, I just don't. So much as I love art documentaries, I just thought I, I, I want to make something original, even if it's n- not as good. I just want to make my own work. Yeah. So. And you've done a lot of comedy and we have we have this stigma here that um, women aren't particularly funny and it's quite a leap for a woman to direct something funny. Did you find any obstacles that way or you were just able to prove it? I think things have changed in the last 10 years. I really do. Not that women have got funnier. <laughs> are, Noted. Uh, that uh, people have suddenly stopped being ridiculous and realized that I think there's just more funny women uh, on TV. So yeah. we, we're used to it. We see that women, in fact, are funny, shock. And um, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I, I definitely, there were, I had some strange, I did have some strange interviews where I just thought if I could sit here and talk about football, soccer, I think I'd get this gig. I definitely oh, had funny. one where I thought I did, would. And if I hadn't have said I'd just come back from having a baby, I think I'd got a gig. Well, that's a, that's a killer also. And I just do. And I, and I always like, I do like to sing the best of people. And, but you could just tell the room went a bit frosty and everything stopped. But, but now, you know, an early comedy, um, break I got was Sharon Horgan because I worked with her on I love her. Um, yeah. And I worked with her on a, um, it, it, you know, I didn't, I've known her for a while and she did had this idea and it was a mockumentary and I'd done lots of documentaries. So I said, I'll do it. And I, I really desperate to get out of documentaries. So I'll just, I'll do it for free. I really, really want to do documentaries. Uh, sorry, comedy. I really want to do comedy. And, um, so we shot it like a documentary and then that eventually after two years became an actual sitcom commission and they got back in touch with me, which is great. So they didn't junk me and go to someone else. They said, do you want to direct it? It's now a scripted comedy and I said yes 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 I do and that was really good because then that then I could get an agent so I went to see agents say look I'm about to get hired for a six-part comedy so finally they go will you take me on um so that that made a huge difference so I think that it's much better now really much better now they weren't that so many not only were they mainly men directing but it wasn't just that it was really like an Oxbridge thing if you you see all these people and they you can't Britain is just weird it's still very classist and it's still dominated by private schools people going into um and I just see not only are they all men but they all come from a certain they come from six percent I'm sorry it's my ranting but it's quite weird it, unpack that a little bit for an American audience when you say the Oxbridge set. Like, I, I have an idea of what you're talking about, but can you unpack that for us a bit? Is it like if all the people went to Harvard and Yale and they all knew each other? In Britain, it is changing, but certainly 10 years ago in comedy, you'd find not only that a lot of the producers and directors were from um, Oxbridge, which means Ivy League. That's, you know, you look at Oxford and Cambridge, that's what we mean by that. Yeah. Um, and they have a great tradition of comedy. So there is a reason why they may have come up through there. There's Cambridge Footlights, you may have heard, where Monty Python came through there. Um, you know, all these Emma Thompson. And then Oxford has a great tradition of comedy. But the bar, it was a big proportion. So you, so imagine that comedy in the States is dominated just by Ivy League or just by, say, Yale and... Harvard. Yeah, <laughs> Yale and Harvard. That's it. And everyone's like, you know, and you're unusual because you don't, you don't you haven't gone to either of those right you're not in that fraternity yeah and and it's not the same anymore because I think YouTube had a massive impact on comedy talent because you see a lot more things people honing their characters and then coming through and going no I want to direct that and people going okay it's your character you do it much better and also the amount of women coming through so those two things have made a massive impact for the better 
Yeah, social media is like the great equalizer in some ways. Yeah, it's good, and it and sometimes I it's interesting. In the last say five years, I've been given projects which are that they, they say, oh, these are for they're doing their. It's a pilot on no, sorry, they've been doing it on um, YouTube, and we're we're remaking it for television, and they just cut the life out of it. It's become conventional. They've cut the madness, and it hasn't become. You know, sometimes YouTube is a better outlet because you've got you've got more freedom but they haven't got the money so you can't survive so you plug it into the formula yeah so it's, that's it we'll ramble you and cut that bit <laughs> now talk to me a little bit about how you work with actors i would think with your acting background you would have some special insight into that yeah but remember i wasn't a very good actor <laughs> <laughs> but you know it when you see it yeah i do but I tell you what working with actors working in documentaries has really helped me with actors because it's not like everything has to be documentary real. But I'm very good, I think, at hearing the way people speak. I've spent a lot of time interviewing people, a lot. So I'm quite attuned to the way people talk and when people are lying because they want mm. people to think better of them. So I get frustrated with scripts where I feel that um, for no reason they've become unreal and it doesn't mean to say everything has to be gritty and it doesn't actually mean that everything has to be super documentary but they have to be different or distinctive and so I do get frustrated when I feel that the lines could be given to any character I should think that only that character can say those lines and sometimes you just get writing that's a bit interchangeable anyway with actors it's weird because the big things I've done the first two big things I did uh, recently, I came in on the second block and you don't get any rehearsal. You're working with quite big stars. This is on Victoria and Harlots. No rehearsal. You get a read-through, and one of the read-throughs, because they're all shooting, half the people aren't there. So you actually don't get, you've, you've, you don't get any real rehearsal. And the first time you meet them is when you go on set and you're recceing and you say hi and you might just grab them. But there was one actor I didn't see two. I didn't see until the day. Then how do you how do you that do it? Really difficult because you've got so you're coming in, they don't know you and they're looking at you like, who is this? With the best will in the world. And they know their character over how many se- two seasons. So they are what, sixteen plus episodes into the and they really know their character and they've got someone new and they don't know what you're like. So actually it's it's a real challenge in that. That's very different to the deceived where I started it off but yeah so first off you have to build trust yeah and you have to build it immediately how do you do that I try and show them that I've done my homework that I know what immediately has led up to what I'm directing and as much deep background as I can in terms of the other seasons um and also what I've learned is that you you've got to back off a bit In that situation where you're, especially block two in a big thing, you've got to let them show you who they are, who their character is. And actually, okay, you need, I I always have to come with a plan and I come with camera plans and shot lists, um, mainly camera plans and sometimes even storyboards. But actually, sometimes you think this person, this actor really does not want to do this and they have good reasons. Sometimes it's a, it's, battle of wills for power sake they just need to assert themselves but sometimes it's mainly it's not mainly it's because they just think cliche as it is my character would not do that and if they are and I think you just have to listen so that it boils down to I have to I have to listen to genuinely listen to what they're saying and not make them feel rushed and give them a sense of being able some freedom so sometimes junking what I thought and planned and going with what they've gone but also I think they do respect you if you go if you've if finally they see the reason why you're saying I think this is the setup so I think it's about knowing that you've done your homework their character and also giving them the space to show you so not over not micro directing them um I think that's important it seems like an incredibly tricky balance because I'm hearing you do massive preparation and then you have to be open and quiet enough that you may have to throw it all out, but informed with all that preparation that you've done. I think it was interesting on um, Victoria because that happened quite a lot. I'd go with something and the cat and the actors are quite playful and they'd just tease me and say, Oh, I'm not doing that. 
And then eventually, <laughs> and it will be like, oh, just do it. I know it works. I know it'll be cool. Just do it. You can do it. You can do the acting. I, you know, just do it in that shape with those shots. It'll be great. And it doesn't happen. And then the end, at the end of the day, I look back and thought, actually, they did do it. It just took a long time. And the reason it took a long time is they didn't want to feel like they had nothing to contribute. They don't want to feel like pawns on a chessboard. They want to feel like they're not walking from so-and-so to so-and-so. They are the person who is doing this thing, which is obviously what they should feel because that's what, you know, I don't wander around aimlessly in a room. I get up to make a cup of tea or I get up because I don't want to look at someone anymore so I walk to a ro- I walk to a window so it's it is hard it is hard it's the balance you almost have to make it their idea you definitely have to make it their idea <laughs> this is why a lot of teachers the people I've met who have been kids teachers are really good directors because they're very good at making people kids feel like it's their idea and I was quoted once someone said um what do you feel about actors so I'll say it to you um, actors are like children and that makes a lot of actors splutter but what I mean with that is a compliment because a lot of us have just lost our inner child um, and they we're asking them actors to immediately access an emotion that we may have just repressed but we have to we have to get them to okay take two do it again and that emotion, they may be getting it through recalling actual real trauma or intellectualizing that character. We don't know. Or, but we're so they have to have no barriers to that. And that's quite you can see why a lot of actors are get very anxious because it, it's very it's actually it's quite a, it's a very intense thing to do to, to be that emotional and open on demand. And that's what we are asking them to do. And tweaking it all the time, you know. Incredibly difficult. And they have to walk around a big, open, vulnerable nerve. Mm. I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. it's. Um, and then we, then we want them to switch off and just be the actor. And, and so as much as, you know, what I mean is actors are children is that they often, they, they've, they have this immediate access. They express themselves. They often, they go from highs to lows quickly and they, they express their, their actual emotions, whereas a lot of us keep it hidden. Sometimes it's frustrating because you feel like, do you feel like saying, I feel that too, but I can't say that because I'm the director. I've got to hold it all together. You can lose it. But you know, I, I have to be very to, mature. Yeah, I have to be very mature. I don't feel mature. I feel really annoyed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's why I'm really, fa- I'm really fascinated by actors. I, I guess I'm quite jealous because I would love to act. Yeah. yeah. I had a friend say to me once, I think in college that everybody deep down either wants to be an actor or a rock star. Yeah. yeah that's true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now let's talk about um, directing intimacy scenes. Hmm. Do you have a special secret sauce around that? And do you use intimacy coordinators much in the UK? It's really interesting what's happening there because I haven't yet, and I'm very keen on intimate coordinators generally but I feel reticent about it I'm looking forward to working with people but I also as a director I can't help resenting the fact that I think I am a responsible person and I feel deeply about portrayal of women and women's desire and I'm not a kind of just terrible manipulative male chauvinist not that it's just men but (laughs) and so I yeah, I, I think they're a good thing, but I don't think it's always necessary. But I think it's very useful for actors to separate themselves because I've talked to actors, the idea that they can see it more as a skill and they there's a lot of danger, what I was talking about, there's a lot of danger in if you're doing something physically intimate, how do you put that barrier up as an actor? Do You, you might end up giving yourself away or, you know, giving some, if you're kissing someone really, really, passionately kissing someone it could be quite disturbing sometimes so to have someone else like a stunt coordinator for intimacy is quite useful because they have that language to say um okay this is the one where you you break it down you go one two and then you do this and recently for the deceived we uh, we had a scene where for the actress it was her first sex scene which I felt very responsible for Mm. and we had the DOP the cinematographer's female she was operating as well we had a really nice team a very very sensitive first assistant director 
and a very experienced lead male who was very sensitive to her. Um, and obviously she didn't want to feel or anyone to feel like to treat her differently. But I think it went really well because we were all very, you know, respectful. It was close set and all that. And then another scene, we had someone who was very experienced and it was a much rougher scene and it was on some stairs. And we talked about it the night before with the two leads. So I said, OK, well, how um, how do you want to do this? This is my idea of it. How do you feel about it? And we just sort of built on that. So I said I want it to be as rough as possible. So it's that grey area between, it was about coercion really, between forcing someone and actually passion. So you feel mm-hmm. uncomfortable. You know someone's not being forced, but you feel like it's not quite right. And she was really up for that. And then she agreed with the actor about what would be the, the, the sign to stop. We all agreed that if she felt uncomfortable, if he felt uncomfortable, because he might have done either as well. And and she was we had a really good relationship because she just said look I'm she basically we trusted each other and I just said you I, I'd often go you show me she talked to me for an idea I said just show me just go for it and I'll just say if it's too much or she'll just come and say do you want more and I say yeah yeah and that was fantastic because that was so freeing I didn't have to worry about her because she trusted me and I trusted her and she also wanted to do it she wanted to make it look the way I wanted it to look and that was great. I love, I love that because I didn't feel worried. And then, interestingly, on Victoria, there was a different thing. There was, a, there was. It's a different time slot. It's a different audience. Um, there's a lot more skirts, <laughs> a lot more <laughs> crinoline and stuff. But I had a different feeling for that. I wanted it was sort of makeup sex, and you don't see any sex at all. It was just the beginning of undressing. But I had a very strong feeling that I wanted the Queen to start undressing. Victoria starts undressing Albert, and that's just my that was just my thing. I think it's very sexy when women undress men. You don't see enough of it, I think. <laughs> so, um, and 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 I think things are quite nice slow as well. And I think. Yeah, I think a lot of it is actually my personal taste, things I really, my pet hates, I won't do. And I, I don't, that's the great thing about being dressed. You have got some power. I think I don't have to do that. So I hate it. And if I see it, I think, Jesus, Chloe, why did you do that? Listening to you talk about that, I wonder if, if the, in the history of cinema, <laughs> directors approached intimacy the way that you're talking about it, we, we may not have needed intimacy coordinators. I think you're right. I mean, I know people are comparing to stunts. It's not the same as stunts because it's not generally, because it's not a physical danger of dying or being injured generally, unless you've got, unless you've got someone restrained or, you know, I'm serious about, you know, if it's a sadomasochistic thing or some other kind of, but in scenes of consensual sex, if you, if you're able to talk about it and you're happy and it's written and it expresses and things can be violent and horrible, but if it expresses what it needs to express and the people are on board and you're open about how you're going to film this, then you can do it. It is quite awkward because you're seeing something you wouldn't normally see, but it's all make believe. It's like actually when the people in normal, the actors in normal people were who had an intimacy coordinator, a very good one. And they talked about it and they said, well, everything you see, we were never naked. The whole of us were never naked. And it's shot so well, you feel they are. And yeah. that's important that they didn't feel they can look back as actors and go, well, actually, I wasn't naked. Only my head and shoulders were. It seems to come down to everyone feeling safe enough physically and safe enough to be able to be emotional. It's really safety and trust. Yeah, I feel a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Why? Why? People do play mind games, and that's for sure. I'm not that naive. Actors play mind games. You know, I I just I prefer not to really. I, I can't be bothered. I'm so interested in the I think the truth I to do. I'm so interested in talking about the characters and the storyline and what you're doing. And I'm interested in the truth because the truth is weird. I'm not interested in the truth because it has to be true. It's more like it's that's why documentaries get massive ratings because often they're weirder. It's a cliche. They are weirder than fiction. And the truth in something is not always what you imagine or what you can predict. And I think if you can predict the next line, and sometimes you can of dramas, then it's rubbish. It's yeah. trash. You shouldn't be able to know. You should feel it's right for the character, but you shouldn't be able to go, oh, she's going to say that. <laughs> and I do that all the time. I don't you know. So there yeah. you go. Yeah, it is tr- trust. Is it, is it, because trust is it's freeing. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the makeup of your crews. You know, they 
they, they say, uh, when there is a woman director, there are a lot more women on set in general. Do you find that that's true? Uh, in business, they always say women don't hire women. And I don't know whether that's true in TV. I, I think what I've observed is um, what's, I don't know, it's very hard to know, to be honest. I don't always hire my crew because sometimes you come in and they're already hired for mm, you. Right, right. I have noticed in Britain what's interesting is that children's television has got a much better hiring policy and the reads across all kinds of things. So it's much more diverse. So in terms of you look at the crew photos, right, and it's not all white and you and and there's a lot of there's lots of women. Now, there's a lot of women in TV that there has been for many years, but not in certain roles, as we know, and directing is one of them. But that is changing. But there's fewer, even fewer cinematographers and fewer composers. There's really few female composers. Yeah. The interesting thing about um, The Deceived, that my last project was that because of the funding situation, uh, it was funded by North Screen, uh, Northern Irish Screen. I had to get everyone from Northern Ireland. And actually, I turned, and that was quite interesting. So I basically had three cinematographers I could choose from, and two men and one woman. And the woman had the least experience, but she was the one I was most interested in because of what she bought, her pitch for it. Mm. And she's talented, and she was as talented the talent was there but she just didn't have this would be her biggest break and I just thought and to be honest it was a big project and normally I wouldn't hire someone with that little experience this is being completely frank and I just thought you know what I'm going to hire her because if she's no good and if I'm no good we'll be sacked yeah but if we're good and I think she is all she hasn't got is that experience and she's got to get it somewhere. So I'm going to give her that experience. And if she's good, that is going to help her. And she's now, she did a brilliant job and it was hard. You know, of course it was hard, but I thought, well, this is what she wants to do. So she can't, she can't take it and she shouldn't be in this job. Same with me, you know. And now she's got a really good agent. She wouldn't have got that agent without this credit. So I, and she did that. She did my series without an agent. So, and, um, so that was a, that was a positive decision I made. I just thought all things being equal, I'm going to take a chance on this woman. I only took a chance on this person um, in the sense that she didn't have loads of credits. But I thought she's got, and this is what happens between men and women. Often men are given the benefit of the doubt. So the, the cinematographer is like, oh, he's hot shot. He's out of film school. He hasn't got loads of credits, but he's really good. But it's got the potential. Woman, yeah, the potential thing. So she's got potential. But generally, it will tip in favor of the man. And I thought, right, this time I'm going to tip it to her. And, Good for you. Um, so, and also the the composer, it was nothing to do. She's just a, a fantastic, we were just really, really lucky. She happened to have moved to Northern Ireland. But again, it was, it was so it was me, the producer, the producer, and the DP. So all three women, we had a, a, a male, I mean, I like having mixed crews. I do. I think it's really good. There was a, there was a, a electrician trainee who's female which is good um in fact and we got as soon as we could actually my second unit I hired someone who I'd met in Northern Ireland I hired a woman as the second so I did as much as I could I just thought why not I've got that opportunity they're all here they need breaks and they're good they just don't have the CV yet that's great did you get pushback from the network especially on the DP choice it was interesting. I didn't get it directly, but I, it was a long time before it came through as a yes. Because they were looking at short films. And I get it. I, d I do get it. They were looking at short films and film school films. And she hadn't, you know, people want people are risk averse because it's yeah. money. They are. I understand that. So they want to know in business, you, they want you to have done the thing that you're about to do. Sure. Um and she hadn't. She'd done different things, but she had good ideas and she had the talent. So yes, there wasn't pushback, but there was there was a lot of talking to her. There was a lot of Zoom conversations. There were more than would have been for other people because of, they had to make sure she could take it. And I think subconscious that subconscious bias I think is there, but obviously no one can say it. But there is an element of can this woman control a crew, which is what I get, but no one is allowed to say it anymore. But it's there. So a lot of reassuring has to happen. Yeah. And then in the end, I did, honestly, I thought if it all goes wrong, I'll have to deal with that. But what's the worst that can happen? We, I mean, honestly, we, we get a new 
cinematographer. Yeah. But I knew that was going to happen because she's good and she's really hungry and she's, she's really good. Well done. <laughs> now, what do you make of, um, you know, I used to ask people, what do you make of what has happened with women in the last two, three years? Uh, but now the whole world is exploding. So <laughs> what do you make of this moment in time that we're in? Oh, that's huge, isn't it? I think that it comes down to what people have been saying a lot, which is you have to get as many people's stories as possible. And that means viewpoints. And it's interesting that when I was at university, when I was at school, they we talked, we looked at film theory and people talked about the male gaze. We read that stuff. And now, what's that, 20 years later, people are, people talk about it normally and they understand mm-hmm. what it means. Then it was a sort of slightly obscure theoretical standpoint on art. Right, like what does that mean exactly? Yeah. Because it's like, what's water? Mm. So now I think people have got a handle on that. I think that, um, I think life is very, co- life is very complicated and it's, it's good that you're constantly, one is constantly challenged. Or I, you know, I'm a very prejudiced person and yet I don't, I think everyone, my standpoint is that everyone is very prejudiced and they just have to own up to it, be aware of it. And you have to check your prejudices. You have to realize them. You have to realize your unconscious bias. I think that's true. I think we all have to do it. And I think, you know, as a white person, particularly, um, and I, it's interesting. I, at the beginning of the Trump, um, um, era. I, don't know, I was about to call it business. <laughs> the beginning of the Trump era, people were vet being very hysterical about you know the beginning of uh, Nazi Germany and what happened then. I think, oh come on! And then they went through those steps, you know, burning of books or whatever, or banning things or curtailment of democratic rights, you know, attack on the judiciary, or whatever. And I thought, and, and I, it does make me feel very uneasy, very uneasy, and 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 no doubt. Uh, things are polarized you know so here for example you know the row about brexit the kind of name calling the inability again to be honest you know we're living in in the middle of i feel like there's a massive tsunami coming our way in the Mm -hmm. western world of unemployment and that's going to be extremely bad for people who are the lowest paid in societies extremely bad and we're just not being honest about it and tinkering at the edges. I don't know. It's a, it's a much bigger subject. But I fear what's going to happen in a few years in terms of unrest, because I think it's going to hit people very badly and hard. It does feel like we're uh, peeling the onion. Yeah. And every layer keeps getting revealed. How is um, how is the pandemic in England now? Are you getting a handle on it? No, it's what well, we did, because lockdown was quite well observed. And it, it's Lockdown is very good because it broke the chain for a while, transmission chain. But, of course, it just starts again. As soon as you've got universities back, colleges back, obviously it started again, schools back, starts again. But, you know, we, obviously now we know a lot more. We know that it's, it's, it's young people are quite, seem quite capable of coping with it without getting seriously ill. And obviously um, treatment protocols have changed in terms of not putting everyone on a ventilator. Yeah. You know, so it's going up. Short answer is COVID rates are going up and everyone is panicking about it and wondering what the hell is going to happen to jobs because they have this furlough scheme here where the government pays a certain, you know, so to ensure people are kept on. And then to people like me who are self-employed, if you earn enough being self-employed, you could, or you've been self-employed enough for a long time, you could get a grant, but it's a small amount. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be tough because the government can't do that forever. So I think jobs, some jobs will literally disappear. I wonder actually whether the pandemic will happen. It definitely has an effect more on women than men because women have gone back. To, there's no childcare. They go back to childcare. Yeah. And childcare doesn't start up again. And then the jobs disappear. And so I think it's going to have, I wonder if it's going to change the makeup of film and TV production as well. Although there's so much appetite to get back to film and TV production, it is actually happening now. And everyone is, um, because it's so important to the British in, uh, British economy. There's so much yeah. being shot here. You know, so you, I see a lot of my friends in masks and visors and things like that. And I, I tell you, I am not looking forward to directing in a mask. I, of course I will, but I hate the idea of it. 
because I, I don't even know whether a visor is is safe enough. I've seen people in visors, but it's just you use so it's just cutting off half your face to talk to actors. You know, I laugh a lot. I just I just hate the idea of being behind a mask, but got to do it. I know the whole thing is just terrible. Um, talk to me about the next project that you're working on. Well, in, really excitingly, um, for years and years, I've thought, um, well, I've always made the you know, short film um, and things like that. And I've always been writing things. And then I looked at all these ideas I've got and I thought, that's a slate. I really should start a production company. So I have. I've started, a production, yeah, I've started a production company, uh, really just for IP purposes. So, for example, that, you know, obviously I do want to produce things, but also that I can go with an idea or a script and go and go in co-production with another company. So I started my own production company. What did you name it? One Glove Films, because I'm really obsessed with hands because it's a magic object in across all religions. You know, you get the eye of God, you get Hamza in, um, you get the hand of Fatima, sorry. And um, obviously Christianity and all that kind of thing. So one glove was a pun on one love. And um, so we've, and in my downtime, I made a comedy pilot here um, about a, um, a student doing remote learning. And then I did um, something called Roundheads and Cavaliers, which is about people who dress up, you know, reenactors, historical reenactors. And um, I met the, the writer through Twitter. And uh, I just like this idea. And we got together a tiny bit of funding and we got some costumes together and we shot it at a castle in Essex. And we have, we've got this lovely teaser for a sitcom series and we've got people looking at it. So and we're quite close, I think, to getting a development deal. So I'm very excited about that. But also I've got, I'm about to option someone's life story for a feature film. Um, and I've got, I'm writing myself, but I really like co-writing with people. So I'm basically at the moment, I'm generating my own ideas and I'm reading lots of scripts. So I've had, um, yeah, it's nice. Actually. I like zoom for interviews. It's great. So yeah. I've had, uh, a few interviews for, you know, pure directing jobs recently, which would be exciting, which would, if I got one would probably start the end of this year. Um, and so that really. So I'm kind of doing that. Great. You have all the irons and all the fires. Yeah. What advice do you have for women who are coming up behind you? Um, Don't give up. I mean, honestly, just don't give up. And um, it's, I think it is better now. I think, I think look for collaborators because there's a lot of very exciting, especially camera people, because the people I've seen the most successful kind of get a very good partnership with camera people and take that forward. They don't always work with them, but that's that's a very good thing to do and um get also in britain you can get really good breaks in children's tv and it's in drama and you can sort of cut your teeth in children but you have to get out at a certain point because people are very blinkered about genre i don't know what it's like in the states but they can be yeah so they'll go oh you've done children's so can you do adult you go yeah i can um (laughs) uh you know you haven't done period drama before and you think well it's it's actually the drama they're just wearing funny hats and they've got horses i know what they mean you know it's a bigger budget i'm not stupid but it the risk the risk yeah there's transferable skills (laughs) um so i'd say for women come out don't give up and also someone gave me some really good advice because the interesting thing about being a woman director is often not always you have children in your life you have children and that everyone expected me to give up directing when I had children. Really? Yeah. They said, what are you going to do now? And I thought, they said, you're, are you going to become an exec? Because you can do more of it from home, you know. And I said, I don't want to do anything else. I really don't. And I thought, oh, my God. So I just, that's why, you know, women's CVs often look eclectic. People say that about me. And it's because, you know, when I had a child, then I felt like I couldn't get certain jobs. So I just, but I kept on directing and then I kept on trying to make more openings. So it's not a straight trajectory. But someone said, gave me some really good advice, which is don't worry about having children if you want to have children, because a baby arrives with a loaf under its arm. (laughs) And that was really nice. And it, it was basically, don't worry, it will work out. If you've got a good relationship, you will make it work somehow. And the other good advice is throw money at childcare. So for the first bit of your working life, you will spend all your money on childcare. But if it's good, it's worth it because you're investing, obviously, 
you're having a precious child looked after, but also it makes you feel better that it's okay and that in the end you'll you'll make some money, but you won't in the beginning. I mean, I yeah, and and also kind of weigh up, you know. So I, I guess if because being a woman often is you are responsible for childcare if you ha- if you have children. If you so you've got to think about that. But I so that's why I say don't give up and don't worry about having a circular route. Just carry on and things will come out of other things you know it, everything leads you do get opportunities um so yeah it does typically work out in the end yeah if you if you don't if you don't give up and, and what's nice is that I've got older I think I've got more I've allowed myself to let more of my personality come through with access which is nice my actual which is quite playful and, and sort of cheeky and you know, I, I I tried being cool. It doesn't. I can't. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to be cool. I'd like to be one of those sort of like those men who kind of. I'm not like that. I'm just thought, well, okay, I'm going to be more like. I'm enthusiastic. So at least people can see. I genuinely love what they do. Um, not all the time, obviously. Sometimes I'm like, oh god, that's terrible. But how am I going to break it to them? But, <laughs> but, do yeah. you? Uh... Do you find yourself, uh, are you a bit more introverted than extroverted? I'm definitely more introverted. It's a, I've just chosen my, I keep thinking, why did I choose this? So doesn't suit my personality. Um, yeah, I'm much more introverted and it's quite an effort to stand up and even just go through the shops. It's a real effort. And I just hate, I like being looked at because I liked acting, but I don't, I just want to sit on my own and work it out and think, okay, I've worked it out. But everyone's waiting. They will need everyone, you know, what's your decision? What's your decision? Do it now. Do it loud, even being loud. You know, I'm not a particularly loud person. Um, Yeah, I find it really difficult. Yeah, so is that an extra piece that you kind of have to rev up to do? Because you have all the work. Yeah. In in here, I know I'm gesturing. It's within your person, but then the extra effort of to then share it with the people and and to assume that authority, but in your very uh, almost reserved way, just saying how you you know how you present. Yeah, I find that real challenge actually. And someone once said, "Oh, you're the quietest director I've ever worked with," and I just I found that quite annoying because what they meant was they used to mainly men but people with a lot more swagger and I'm just interested in in other models of power yeah like I have power as a director but I'm not a shouty director and lots of directors aren't most directors aren't I don't think you know David Lynch once said he never shouts I'm sure he did sometimes but it's (laughs) quite common um but it's interesting the amount of times and this is person to be a woman director is that when you do shout the men suddenly feel reassured and it pisses me off actually Mm -hmm. because there has to be other models of power and I realized in one job that was very unhappy uh I was trying too hard to to have a relationship with this DP and first of all I thought oh he's a chauvinist pig and then I thought no that's ridiculous Chloe that's a knee-jerk reaction you know that's not and then after a month I realized no he was a chauvinist pig he had the way he talked about women in his life I just knew I was another one of those women telling him what to do and he didn't like it and he lumped me in with all of them and Mm. I thought I tried to be your friend it was a mistake I've tried to be enthusiastic so that's my innate way it was a mistake there's nothing I can do to get you're never going to get in there no and actually I just thought after I thought why that is my that's normally my default way to bring people in in a circle of enthusiasm so everyone feels they can contribute but they know that I will make the decision so I'm really open to ideas especially if they're better than mine as long as they know I'm going to take the credit that's usually what I say <laughs> and they kind of and that makes them laugh that's fine but he it didn't work with him and he obviously wanted someone to kind of either be a bloke which I can't be or tell him what to do in that sort of in a different way and I, that's not my personality and, and I'm not saying all men and women are the same absolutely not but um I do find that projection and that model of power very interesting and a real challenge so on that job I realized that female models of power what are they in men's lives they are their mother and teachers it's changing a bit but that was generally you know generally everything else is you defer to a man now that there are a lot more 
female bosses um, and managers, and it's slightly different. And if those if those men have a problem with their mother, and that's their female, that's a matriarchal, you know, power structure, then they may it kind of shows, and they just it's it's unpleasant. But also they do, they're not used to it. They feel like it's an issue. I don't have an issue being told what to do by a man. I'm used to it. I look around every every model of power is a man. I've yeah. grown up with that. They look around. It's not every model of power is a woman. They feel it's some men feel it's unnatural. Thankfully, fewer now because they can't get away with it anymore because there's more women in the industry and they're just like, no, we're not going to employ you. You'll get a reputation for not being, you know, being a chauvinist pig and we will not employ you. There are some people, even on the last job, I got references from, thought, I'm not employing you. We're not having you on our set because I don't want, um, I don't, you know, I don't want someone like that on the set. I think we're just not having it anymore. Yeah, I think that's. Like what a beautiful shift that is. And it's still, I think, a shift. Yeah. It takes time, but interesting. In the end, it'll be about the money. You know, if I'm no good, if I'm not right, I won't be employed again, um, no matter how enthusiastic I am. (laughs) But uh, I do think there's different ways of, of. of having power and directing people and that and you know not all men are shouty men but I envy men they have this hard they have this baked in authority they don't always use it but they assume to have it and I envy that I wish I we all had it and I think we we do have it but we we're not assumed to have it therefore it we have to achieve it and we have to really you know um we have to sort of go extra to get it You don't get it just by walking into the room. No. You have to earn it. Yeah. Okay, that's the next mountain to climb. I I mean, people may disagree with me, but I I see it. I think you're not wrong. Okay, what did I not ask you about that I should have asked you about? Uh, I don't know, but that is my, um, yeah, that's that's my big thing I am interested in, female models of power, how to lead as a woman. Um, When you're trying to draw out of people their good work, and but also call out bad behavior that's really hard when people are being because actors can be very badly behaved very badly behaved but you need a good producer to back you up you need to be together on that um but I think you're right I think we're not having it anymore and I think things are changing and as soon as women run more production companies and have commissioning power and budgets things will change interestingly though I've had a few I am slightly against uh the the strong female lead cliche just the way it's you know that as if that's going to solve everything yeah you know i just i want to see more female don drapers people that you cannot take your eyes off and are incredibly magnetic but are very very flawed and sometimes to wicked things and there's more of them um but i think you get you know, you get more of them in documentaries because you just, they just look at real women and real women are as complicated as men and as sort of venal and um, despicable or lovable as men as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think, I think that ca- the writing, the writing for women has to change now and we have to be confident about that as well. Because I, I don't think women just want, I think women just don't want to watch women. I'm really, I, I know I've talked a lot about women directors, so I'm really interested in men. I'm really interested in the pressure on men to be a man. What does it mean? You feel you shoulder all this responsibility. You're still expected to provide. And I think men like providing because it makes them feel good. But there's a, there's a huge amount of pressure on that. And I think that's interesting. And the, and the fact that men are still fairly bad at talking about their emotions. So I'm really interested in male psychology. And I love reading things where, you know, men have to sort of grapple with things that they're expected to be heroic, physically strong, loyal, that kind of thing, which, you know, we should just, yeah, I'm interested in men as well. It's funny. Let's unpack all of it hmm. as if complicated people. Yeah. How can people find you? Uh, well, I've got a website. So chloethomas.net is my website. Okay. And that's got my, what I've done on it. And I put news and things up there. Um, yeah, so they can get in touch with me then, or I'm on, you know, usual. I'm on Twitter, Chloe Jacasta. My mum and dad had a kind of um, Greek tragedy thing. <laughs> so they decided that my middle name should be the mother of Oedipus, the mother <laughs> and lover of Oedipus. So, yeah, Chloe. Okay. Jacasta. 
Yeah. Great. Okay, I'll link to all your things. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was so lovely to talk to you. Well, thanks. It's lovely talking about everything, and I hope that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Chloe Thomas for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. Thanks for listening. See you next time.